good evening uh, everyone and welcome to this uh, insightful episode of talk the book brought to you by the ap state council of higher education our distinguished book reviewer for today is dr k karun sagar who has expertise in the field of english language education dr karun sagar is a seasoned educator adept at imparting english language skills to students from diverse backgrounds with a doctorate and masters degree in philosophy from andhra university he brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the review his proficiency in english literature is unparalleled and his qualifications include certification in apset highlighting his dedication to academic excellence having taught for a decade in various schools organizations and colleges dr karun sagar has honed his skills in teaching verbal aptitude and soft skills empowering his students to succeed in today's competitive market currently associated with anil nirukonda institute of technology and sciences dr karun sagar's research interests encompass literature and british pakistani literature reflecting his passion for exploring diverse cultural narratives today dr karun sagar will grace us with his insights on the book lincoln in the bardo promising a stimulating uh, discussion that dwells in the complexities of literature and human experience lincoln in the bardo by george sanders is a haunting and imaginative exploration of grief loss and the afterlife set in a graveyard where abraham lincoln uh, lincoln's deceased son resides the novel weaves together historical facts with supernatural elements offering a poignant reflection on love redemption and the human condition here we go with dr k sarun Karun Sagar's uh, review on Lincoln in the Bardo by George Sanders. Over to you, Dr. Karun Sagar. Thank you, sir. That's a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much, sir. So today we'll be joining the session regarding, particularly regarding George Sanders' book Lincoln in the Bardo, which I'm going to show. So this is the book, and uh, in this book we have got a uh, number of characters of. Uh, I would like to say nearly 166 characters are available in the book. A uh, book even won the Man Booker Prize in the year 2017. George Sanders is a well-known author. Uh, why? Because he's, he belongs to a middle-class family, and uh, he worked as a knuckle puller, and he worked as he worked as a servant in his own restaurant, and <laughs> he also worked as a technician, and he also. Uh, he belonged to engineering background. He worked as geophysical engineer, and uh, he went to, to Sumatra for oil exploration. All his experience uh, that converted him, though he belonged to technical background, he had uh, put up something into his literature. That literature served him uh, right benefits. So that right benefit is uh, with us. The book called Lincoln and the Bardo. Coming to the title of the book, which is very specific, uh, Lincoln means it's not Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln is the son of Abraham Lincoln. His name is Willie Lincoln. So when he was 11 years old, he suffered uh, from typhoid, and while he was suffering in the deathbed, on the other side, a civil war was going on 1860s, and Abraham Lincoln was the uh, the right witness for that and he uh, on he having his son on the death bed on the other side he threw a grand party to the people who had come to him and the many people started to criticize him saying that uh, on the one side his son is suffering from typhoid and the other side he started to give a, uh, a troubles party to the people of america there <laughs> but his intentions are very different His intentions, uh, his intentions are uh, very clear. He wanted to have a communication with the people to continue or to stop or to prevent the civil war. 
So as the two, two things went around, he felt unhappy with his own son's death. So why we mention uh, Willie Lincoln in this special case is that uh, Willie Lincoln, after his death, he went to uh, Bardo. Uh, we can see the picture here, uh, B A R D O. Bardo, in the sense, it is an intermediary space, intermediary space between heaven and hell. Uh, in other terms, I would like to say that it's a purgatory. Purgatory, in the sense, again, it is a common term in Catholicism. Uh, I would like to clear this term for your convenience. If you do good, or if a people, or if a man is considered good, he would be going to heaven. If a man is considered very bad, he's going to reach hell there. But what about the people, those who would equal, good equal in terms of equal, that means yeah, if he is done good and bad things equal, so where would he go? And so what would he do? So in Catholicism, Pervid is a place where he is chastised until his sins are <laughs> forgiven. Uh, for his punishment will be given to the sins, whatever that he had committed. And then he would be going to heaven. But uh, in the Bardo, here which we are going to see, in Hinduism we call Krishinka Swarga, and here we are going to see uh, a place called Bardo. Bardo is a Buddhist term. It is related to Buddhist term and the people go there. And uh, why do people go there? Because the, uh, the souls of the dead body, that means dead, and they go actually. If their desires are not satisfied, or they want to go back to their past, or they that all they want to live their earthly life, then they will be staying in the bardo. In the bardo, they repeat the same stories again and again, and these stories are never they they are never ended. They will be continued, and when a new person enters, they will repeat the same story to a new person. Now in this story. Uh, Willie Lincoln enters the bardo because he is unsatisfied and he thinks that he could reach his father again and he stays there. And meanwhile, two important characters come there. Those two important characters were uh, uh, Hans Wallman and the Rosa Behrens. And out of 166 characters, we are going to speak only of a few characters which are very important for our novel. And, uh, these two men were very unsatisfied with their life. And before discussing these two characters, I would like to go with uh, themes because we, these themes are very important before analyzing the book or to give review over this book. Those themes which uh, George Saunders normally concentrates on is that absurdism, existentialism, and uh, postmodernism. And coming to another one that is, he also goes to extreme like consumerism. All these uh, themes were widely covered in this book. And uh, overall, these writings were also have got this consumerism and uh, late capitalism, and with particular reference to postmodernism. Uh, in this book, we are going to see the concept and the beautiful philosophy of absurdism. And uh, what is this all absurdism? And what is this all about existentialism? And why did he mention uh, all this? Uh, philosophies. Of course, he directly didn't mention them. The whole book is about death. And of course, we know that death is very strange and we cannot conquer it. And if uh, people know that they're going to die within soon or within few days, then there will be some melancholic feeling. And uh, they feel, they uh, say to themselves that some, nothing is going to last long and they're going to die. The very certain, very particular feeling makes them so sad. And George Saunders concentrated, uh, he is ready to concentrate, he was also ready to concentrate on that particular feeling of uh, solitude and the melancholy and the trauma. And uh, the main source of inspiration behind writing this novel for George Saunders is that one day when George Saunders was traveling in an airplane, Suddenly, a bird hit, or some kind of uh, species which hit the uh, airplane. Uh, fumes rose in the midair, and the uh, plane started to uh, come down. And as the plane started to come down, George Saunders immediately felt that he's going to die. Even the co-passengers were so alarmed, and they were puzzled. And uh, 
uh, they felt that they're going to die. So as they felt that they're going to die, even George Saunders felt that too. And uh, immediately George Saunders started to introspect his own lifestyle, whether he had uh, lived, whether he had led his life properly or improperly. And uh, the very consciousness in that particular instance uh, the consciousness of his own being started to alarm his uh, mind, whether he had, whether he's going to heaven or whether he's going to hell. Meanwhile, his co passenger sitting next to him asked him uh, whether that is going to be normal or not. Then George Saunders, though he knows that it's not normal, he comforts him saying that it's all normal and they're going to land safely. And though he said these words, he was in heart. He was, resigned, he was still afraid of the incident and uh, uh, to his fortune, the plane landed safely. And after the landing of the plane, all the co-passengers, uh, they breathed for the second time. And this particular feeling left the tremors in George Saunders. And he felt that uh, what would if he really dies, where would he go? And uh, so this source of inspiration, this inspiration served as a source for the book called Lincoln in the Heart. And he thought of course, scripting this novel 11 years back. Of course, that means 2017, it was published. And it was like 2008, uh, like that. Okay, and he thought of uh, uh, scripting this novel. <laughs> but what happened there was that he wanted all the matters or he wanted, he doesn't want uh, the content of the matter uh, to be forced. And it should not be like uh, forced intuitions. It should be under, it should be under the intuition. Something should come by itself. That's what he was waiting for chance. He was waiting for the things to turn up. So one day with his cousin and his uh, wife, he was traveling by Georgetown Cemetery where William Lincoln's body was placed. And uh, as he passed by, he saw the theater of uh, Abraham Lincoln and uh, he was holding his son's body in his uh, lap. And that particular picture became another source. So he wanted to document both of these things and he wanted to put uh, the death of William Lincoln and, and the theater. These two things gave him an idea to uh, script the novel called Lincoln in the Bardo. So Lincoln in the Bardo, as I was telling you, it was it has got a magical realism, intertextuality, and absurdism. And uh, uh, I would like to go back to the story where I stopped, and the story where I was uh, going with uh, uh, when Willie Lincoln enters the Bardo, two men greet him and they welcome him. The one is uh, Hans Wallman, and other is the Roger Barrens. Hans Wallman is uh, 46 years old. And he marries a woman, young woman at a late age. And uh, uh, they do not have any conjugal relation. And his uh, wife is afraid of him. And he's rather, she's rather hesitant to, uh, to be in relation with him, to say that uh, sexual relation, that's what I mentioned, the conjugal relation, as, she, as he's too old. Understanding her thought, understanding her, uh, are giving her a freedom of choice. And Swalman allows her to, uh, to take her own time to be with him, to spend one night with him. And that's why he waits for her uh, consent. And one day, uh, his own uh, wife accepts it because he treats her rather friendly. Out of this friendliness, and she gets impressed with his a uh, jovialness. See, the, she gives consent writing a piece, writing on a piece of paper, saying it to him that she is ready and uh, they are going to explore a new continent. So, uh, Hans Wallman feels so happy about the incident. Why? Because that day he is going to enjoy his own pleasures that he had never experienced. And uh, thinking of the night which he's going to spend, he comes down the stairs. As he comes down the stairs, suddenly, a beam from the ceiling falls down upon him, which kills him. And he dies on the spot, and his dead body is carried, and he is placed in coffin. And the soul of Hans Wallman does not want to leave the earth, and it feels 
it wanted to go back to its body. So here we can understand that uh, one important thing regarding Hans Wallman. After his death, he pokes and he keeps the poops afresh and he keeps the, he hides the poop. Why? Because if at all it is seen by the visitors, he might be embarrassed. So he doesn't want to show it to anyone or he does not want anyone to open the tomb or he does not want anyone to witness what happened there. So he hides it. So in this particular incident, and he even repeatedly calls his uh, body warm and he calls his coffin as a, a sick box. Many critics said that, uh, said that Hans Wallman, he is called Hans Wallman is calling his, uh, his own coffin a sick box and one feeling that they, they commented on Hans Wallman that Hans Wallman did not believe that he is dead and he is going to go back his past. That's what he is in part. <laughs> so such kind of feeling they do not believe that they are dead and they they are trying to reconnect their past and the other side. Another character which I will speak in this context is the Roger Bevins. Roger Bevins is, uh, contrary to any other human being, is a homosexual and uh, he loves another man called Gilbert. And when he proposes Gilbert, Gilbert denies his proposal. And as he denies, he feels so sad and disappointed. And he takes a knife and slits his wrist. As he slits his wrist, blood passes out. As the blood passes out, he then understands the value of life and he goes down go down the stairs to call for some help as he is about to leave his last breath immediately he calls upon god and he just looks at the nature and he tries to enjoy the beauty of the nature he praises it to calling saying that the whole nature is engineered by god and he wants to go to the nature and enjoy every pleasure that is existent in the whole nature. But by the time, the time is lost and his soul leaves the body and he also reaches the battle. So these two things which clearly indicate that the people, they sometimes, they take some hasty decision. For example, with a particular regard to Roser Bevins, he does not want to be in Bardo. He wants to go back to his life and he wanted to be with his love, so that is Gilbert, but Gilbert denies it. So when something does not happen according to us, we commit suicide. And that's what, the, and a few people, I'm saying, a few people commit suicide and rather Bevins is one such example. Why he is such a, one example is that uh, many people who are disappointed and this particular concept is related to absurdism. Albert Camus has written a beautiful book called Myth of Sisyphus. And he says that what an absurdity is. He says that absurdity is unre unreasonable silence to the need of a man. Unreasonable silence to the need of a man. And uh, uh, taking this line into our context, if at all we analyze uh, Albert, oh, sorry, if at all we analyze our Bevin's character, we can understand that he has taken a solution for his absurdity. The absurdity which rose in his heart that the solution is a suicide. Even uh, Albert Camus, he also says three solutions to overcome our absurdism. First of all, what is called absurdism? That's what my other question is. Absurdism, uh, absurdism is something strange and uh, we do not uh, want this uh, strange things are something which go contrary to our wish. So that comes as absurdism. And in this case, I would like to go to his own Albert Camus, so his own past. Albert Camus wants to live a happy life, but he suffers from TB and he loses uh, his pre presence, uh, presence of mind. And uh, after looking at the wars, he feels so unhappy with himself. And the doctors declare him that he will be dead. This particular incident makes him uh, traumatic, and uh, all the melody in his mind uh, turns him uh, anti god. That means he, may, he makes him, that means all these uh, points make him uh, against God, make him take against God. So he says that 
uh, whatever the life which we are leading in, there is no meaning to it. There is no meaning to it. And here to cite an example of uh, uh, myth of Sisyphus. Myth of Sisyphus. Sisyphus is a Greek legend. He is cursed by gods because he captures death there. As he captures death, the gods curse him that he should carry a boulder to the top of hill and it only comes back again. And as it comes back again, he has to carry it back to the top of the mountain. And he feels in this context, so it is a burdensome. But in spite of it being burdensome, he has to carry it. And the only thing which goes in his mind is not to worry about the situation, but to carry the boulder back. He knows that he's not going to come back to, uh, he's not going to have a life which is all right. So Albert uh, Camus says that Sisyphus, in the end, he only smiles, and with his smile, he is going to revolt against the God. So, for every absurd situation which rises within us, there are three solutions which Albert Camus offers. The first one is physical suicide, and second one is uh, uh, a religious suicide, that means philosophical suicide, and third one is uh, a revolt. Physical, philosophical, and third one, a revolt. Physical suicide is even Albert Camus doesn't support it if you if you even if you commit suicide. Because it doesn't give you any solution because you do not know what's going to happen after the life. And whereas he gives a philosophical suicide, a philosophical suicide, whenever some absurdity rises in your heart, you just believe in God. And God, you think that God will help you out of the situation. That's called philosophical suicide. For this, he gives an example of uh, uh, Soren Kierkegaard's beautiful philosophy called the leap of faith. To completely believe in God. And third one is revolt. She asks every person to revolt against God by a smile and accept the situation and to follow it. Uh, imagine I would like to make it easy for you to understand. Suppose if a couple is going uh, to a fair and with their child and uh, as they go forward in the affair, and the child is lost, and immediately they pray to God. And if the child is found, the faith in God multiplies. What if the child is lost, and if he is not found? The faith in God dies, and they start questioning God. They question God, saying that whether uh, uh, they should believe in God because nothing had happened, because whatever they wanted, because the world is silent and the God is silent to his their own needs. So, in this context, so what Albert Camus says for it will be advised from uh, by Albert Camus that the couple should accept their fate and uh, to go on with the situation and to revolt against the tragedy and the God by having a smile on their face. But whereas on the other side. If, the, if they start introspecting themselves and what to do after uh, the losing of the child, if they make a choice as whether to move, whether to not to move, whether to uh, be happy, whether to adopt a child, if they make choice, choice making, making is called existentialism, which is uh, proposed by Jean Paul Satter and even Nietzsche and Soren Kierkegaard also. So, this beautiful concepts like absurdism and uh, uh, existentialism were seen in this part. Now, I would like to come back to the two characters, or the main character that is Bevin. So Bevin commits suicide, and he feels that he wanted to go back, which is a clear example of uh, absurdism. And after this, what happens was that after meeting two characters, and uh, we are going to speak of another character who also meets uh, our uh, Willie Lincoln, that is uh, Reverend Everly Thomas. Uh, Thomas is a, a priest, we can say, it's uh, exactly like uh, uh, he is a strong believer in God. And before coming to a Bardo, uh, Reverend Everly Thomas, uh, he goes to place of judgment. And uh, he does not reach directly to Bardo. After reaching to the place of judgment, he happens to see two men. Uh, one is a sinner and uh, one, one, two men there actually. And uh, one is considered sinner, one uh, other one is a virtuous man. 
and he just uh, judged them, one of them sinner, one of them is uh, virtuous, but a Christ-like figure appeared before them. And this Christ-like figure started uh, examining these two people there. He asked, he asked the angel to take the heart of each person and the angel took the heart of each person and uh, it uh, places it on a scale and measures whether he had done, whether he had led his life virtuously or not. And uh, with the first person of whom our uh, Reverend over Everly Thomas considered sinner, uh, Christ-like figure was happy with his character and he sent him to heaven. There is other man who has got a black robe, which is an example of another priest who is leading a devotional life, is considered sinful, and he is cast into heaven. And with this judgment, Reverend Everly Thomas felt shocked, and, uh, and his hair immediately it, uh, stands up. Showing its manifestation of uh, manifestation, how he was shocked at the judgment of God, and he says that God is unpredictable, and uh, immediately angel calls his name, and thinking that he would also be judged uh, sinful, he starts to run away from his place. As he starts to run away from his place, what happens was the whips of fire just pass over him, and uh, they say that not to reveal these incidents or anything, anything of such kind of things to any of the people. Even if he reveals all these incidents to any of the people, he would be severely punished. So he comes back after the uh, judgment's place, uh, leaving the judgment's place, he goes to the place called Bardo. After going to the Bardo, he meets uh, Hans Wallman and the uh, other one is uh, uh, Rosa Bevins, after meeting them, he wanted to say to them that they should leave Bardo and they need to go to place of judgment, but he doesn't want to tell because if he reveals, there will be severe consequences as it was warned by uh, angels. So he does not reveal. He watches everything in him and uh, he asks them, he makes them all the talk with the people, but he never lets out any secret out of his box. So he keeps mum. And what happens here is under context in the sense after uh, <coughs> uh, this part, uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, he wanted to uh, see his uh, son. So he, he comes to Georgetown Cemetery to look, at, to look at his boy's corpse. As he goes to the corpse of his boy, he opens the lock, and when, when he enters, every uh, person in the bardo uh, feels so happy. It is very rare for them because uh, a living being does not come to a uh, cemetery to visit corpses. So, but Abraham Lincoln comes there to visit his boy there. So people immediately, they start uh, looking at him. They wanted to converse with Abraham Lincoln, but they cannot communicate, and they wanted to uh, maintain, uh, they wanted to communicate with uh, a term called telepathy. They wanted to have a telepathy with uh, Abraham Lincoln, but uh, that that doesn't work out. So uh, when Abraham Lincoln comes there, so he takes the body into the hands of uh, into the hands of Abraham Lincoln and he places it uh, in his lap, and he cries there. And even Billy Lincoln looks at his father. He cries there. And he wanted to jump into his father's heart. And when he enters and he feels nothing, only coolness. And he feels that he is lost. The father is very unhappy with his death. So he feels all of this. And uh, Abraham Lincoln says, uh, he utters a word that he would revisit again. With this utterance, uh, William Lincoln feels so happy. And he wanted to, uh, he will said he, he wanted to be uh, there itself without leaving the bardo. So he wanted to be there itself. Uh, looking at this part and uh, all this uh, Abraham Lincoln, as Abraham Lincoln leaves, they wait and uh, they wanted to communicate with Abraham Lincoln, 
because all the souls gather, they wanted to communicate with him, but that doesn't happen. Uh, why? Because uh, we know that it didn't work out also. So uh, I would like to bring in this context, the postmodern element in this, because uh, after his death, many people start, they start to criticize Abraham Lincoln. And uh, all these criticisms of the George Saunders gathers in an eclectic approach. So very, very, this very concept is called intertextuality. Uh, there, I said that there are nearly 166 characters. These characters are actually taken uh, from uh, these different sources like uh, newspapers, magazines, and uh, other pamphlets. And it collects all of them. And so this is one, one of the postmodern elements that is intertextuality. And uh, there are three intertextual elements. That is, uh, one is obligatory, second is optional, and third is uh, accidental. Now, whatever George Saunders had done, it becomes obligatory intertextuality. Why this obligatory inter intertextuality? Because we had bring in, uh, we had brought in all the elements or the criticism based on the uh, real life of persons and their uh, uh, criticisms at one place, as they were all brought, and we could read and we can make sense that it is one uh, obligatory intertextuality. Another example which I would like to give you is Tom Stoffer's uh, uh, Rosencrantz and the Guildenstern's. So this particular book, if at all you want to understand, you need to go back to Hamlet, which was written by William Shakespeare. This is called obligatory. If you don't know the characters, you don't understand what's happening in the book. And another uh, second one, which I would like to speak in this context is optional. Optional in the sense, for example, if at all you watch The Lord of Rings, it carries some close resemblance to another uh, film that is Harry Potter. They both carry uh, close resemblance, but it is only optional. You can watch or you need to watch uh, are the two films. Uh, you can you can watch any film. You can, you can film at uh, uh, at any time at once, and you need not to have any kind of hypotext uh, to understand uh, the letter text. And the third part, which I would like to speak, is accidental accidental intertextuality. Accidental intertextuality is nothing but if you all you read uh, Herman Melville's book is uh, Moby Dick. If you read it. Uh, Paris has, it, is, it stands as a closism, but it's not a closism, but accidentally you might uh, think of uh, Jonah, uh, a biblical reference, uh, a prophet in Bible who goes and uh, who doesn't heed to the God's command and he goes to another town and God's get angry and uh, he, uh, jump, he asks him to jump into the sea. Of course, the people, they just throw him into the sea and he enters into the whale. And all this carries somewhat uh, reference to the other text called the Moby Dick. Now in this part, in uh, Lincoln and the Bardo, the intertextuality is uh, uh, almost all the critical comments. Nearly uh, one fourth of the book is all of intertextuality. Uh, they all carry some kind of uh, critical comments by the speakers. All these were put in one place, and some of them they like the Abraham Lincoln, some of them dislike the Abraham Lincoln. Why? Because Abraham Lincoln did some of them because uh, Abraham Lincoln was fighting for slavery, but whereas other people they were not fighting for slavery, they wanted to go against it. So they started to criticize Abraham Lincoln. So that's where we could see all of the book is full of this. And then comes to other part because I have gone, gone through three important characters there and. Uh, Abraham Lincoln leaves the place as was. Uh, now I'm going back, back to novel there. Uh, as Abraham Lincoln goes back there, and all the characters in the border, they come together, they want to communicate. And uh, they think that Abraham Lincoln will come back to talk to Willie Lincoln. As Willie Lincoln is ready to have a telepathy with his father, because Abraham Lincoln promised. <laughs> Billy Lincoln that is going to come back. So one by one, all the women characters and other characters, they come together and they uh, express their wish. And uh, here in this case, we are going to see one of the important uh, women characters, uh, another important character is a female voice, 
this female voice is nothing but uh, uh, she directly questions God. And she also says to Willie Lincoln that she says that she murders her own baby and uh, she has done a lot of atrocities. And this female voice questions the existence of God and freedom of choice, saying that uh, she does not want to be born, but God made her, uh, God um, gave her life and God made her to be born in the world. That was the question. It's not me and it's not my wish or my will to be born in this world. It's all God's plan. So it is a clear concept against uh, free will. Free will, which we would like to speak in, uh, we, uh, immediately we can go back to Paradise Lost, John Milton's free will. Uh, free will in the sense, it's just like existentialism, we have make, we make a choice, but it's different from existentialism. In the free will, we believe in God. In existentialism, we do not believe in God. In uh, free will, we believe that uh, God uh, gives, uh, gives us choice. But whereas in existentialism, we feel that, uh, and uh, even Jean Paul Setter says that uh, man are thrown, and uh, men are thrown into this life. After being thrown into this life, they need to have their own uh, pros and cons. And uh, for this concept, Jean Paul Setter says that, Setter says that uh, every person is thrown into the world and he is an artisan to make his own craft. He says that if something is wrong, it is pure individual choice. It's not something extraordinary or God didn't do it. Or there is no God which is existing. That's what he says. Now, in this context, uh, even George Saunders does not believe this and does not believe in God. He directly questions, saying that, whose will is this? If a woman uh, kills her own baby, whose will is this? Will God allow a baby to be killed, which is innocent? That's what a question comes from a female voice in the novel. And later on, we can also see other uh, you know, philosophical ideas in this context. After understanding female voice, we can also see other stories of uh, George Saunders. Even they, those stories also mention that it's not their will to be born here in this world. It's all God's plan. So. Uh, even uh, George Saunders, who was a Catholic once, he does not want to believe in God. He changes his motto and attitude. He turns to Buddhism. He understands something is wrong. And he does not understand. And he feels so sad about his own uh, life, which he led. So all these questions rise through female voice. And another character, which I would like to speak in this context is, Another important one, Abigail Glass, and another woman character. Uh, this particular Elena's trainer, this Elena's the trainer, the girl. Uh, critics commented on trainer saying that she is a woman in refrigerator. Why? Because uh, she wanted, in spite of many assaults and mean, in spite of many manipulations done against her, and uh, many people raped her, even. Uh, his own, her own mother uh, welcomes many men to rape her daughter. And though being raped, she wanted to carry a baby. She wanted to uh, give birth to a baby. And uh, this uh, particular reference uh, carries us that uh, her motherly food. She wanted to have a motherly food and she wanted to enjoy uh, a baby there. So this particular reference is a very clear example for our reference that men die, that means the women, though they die, and uh, and uh, why she is taken to border is that she wanted to come back and she wanted to uh, move to different uh, places. And uh, she wanted to have a lot of uh, good things in, his, in her life. But uh, since she carries in Bordeaux, she is stuck to an iron fence, uh, she does not go to heaven or hell or place of judgment. She is stuck there itself. Now I would like to come to another character, Abigail Bless, and uh, she is very stingy. Uh, she carries all unnecessary details, like a triplets, like uh, small stones and uh, twigs and some uh, poops of the uh, birds and bird uh, bird parts. 
all the she carries and she hides them with her and always she checks whether they are there or not. This particular example is a clear reference to all the human beings who go after riches, who go after riches and who become stingy and who, don't, who do not share their possessions with other people. So what happens, there was people then they do not share, their soul gets crushed. This is what even George Saunders says that. So he comments in one term that is soul crushing materialism. Soul crushing materialism. And I was telling regarding women in refrigerator and uh, uh, George Saunders, he uh, sometimes he is not a male chauvinistic. Uh, he also speaks poor for the women. Because in a story uh, called Siok, it's a beautiful story which he had written. He speaks about the women and uh, he gives his own uh, uh, experience. One day when he goes to a nearby a club, a merry-go-round, where his sister, he had happened to see some of the hooters. And just like a club where we see many women dance there, half naked, and uh, men go there and enjoy the beauty of the women and uh, they get uh, uh, enchanted or uh, their sexual des uh, desires get satisfied. And with that uh, option or the idea in his mind, and he wanted to replace the woman with men. And what if men are naked, if men are there in a carousel, and how do men react? And he brought out such example, and uh, if at all women are given and uh, chance to speak for themselves, how would they act? And this would be available in the story policy work. Now, in this novel, we could see he also speaks for the women. He says that women are uh, ill-treated by those people. So, all these three characters, they mention about their own problems. And uh, William Lincoln listens to all of these characters and uh, why they mention all their problems to William Lincoln? Because so that William Lincoln may carry all the problems to Abraham Lincoln. So, Abraham Lincoln may take some kind of uh, action, some sort of action to relieve them from the battle. And uh, another character which I would like to speak now, till now we have spoken, uh, spoken a few characters. Now we'll be going to uh, another important characters. They are all slaves right now, and uh, which is uh, later part of the novel. That's completely against slavery. The most cruel, uh, the, the cruelest character in the whole novel, and of course we can call it a Cecil Stone, is a white. And when he led his life or not, he had uh, uh, antagonism against all the blacks and, uh, and he uh, mutilated them, you can say. He raped black uh, uh, women and he even went into their houses and grabbed the men out and uh, he killed some of them, he tortured them and in their absence, he raped many women there. So when he was dead, he continued to do the same thing in, in the Bardo itself. He had antagonism towards the slaves who were there in the Bardo. And uh, there is a fair well under character who is a slave, who is a black, who is who stands face to face with the Cecil Stone. He goes against his attitude and he wants him not to do like that. But there's a fierce between, fierce fight between uh, both of these characters, Cecil Stone and the Farewell. And George Saunders, uh, looking at these two characters, he says that the fight against slavery is a continuous battle. It does not end. If at all, it, if at all, we want to, to, we wanted it to be ended. We need some sort of action to be taken against the slavery, which is possible through Abraham Lincoln. And farewell, he does not want. Uh, he does not want his stone to order them. So there is an ending fight in the border itself. After uh, uh, Cecil Stone, uh, we could see after a farewell and uh, Cecil Stone, he, uh, important line which I missed there. Uh, he mentions uh, all these slaves as the shards of coal. Uh, shards of coal in the sense, he contrasts all the blacks with coal because coal are in, uh, coal is in black color and these are people in black color. And whenever he goes to, he goes near to them, he gets heated up. And uh, uh, in the bar, he's manifested with long hands and long legs and long neck, which shows that he was, he's very proud, even in the bar itself. And uh, 
another character, uh, a woman character, a woman slave, uh, we can see uh, Frances, uh, Mrs. Frances. Uh, she feels so unhappy uh, in the Bardo because she, when she lived on earth, she was not given a chance to enter into the church. Even if was if she was given a chance to enter into uh, enter into church, she, she was allowed to carry her baby or to find some old man and woman. And so this particular uh, incident is a clear difference against slavery, which all the black women were facing. And she does she she wanted to undo all these things. That's what he says happened to uh, Willie Lincoln. And under the slave, she also narrates his past to Willie Lincoln, saying that he led his unhappy he, he led, unlike other masters, his master was so good to him, and he was so happy with his master. But what uh, he felt was that he was unhappy when he was given any command. He doesn't want the people to give commands, or he doesn't want people to uh, say, uh, to carry this or to carry that. She doesn't, he doesn't want anyone to give commands. So, if someone gives a command to him, uh, back of his head, some revolt rises up. He goes against those people. So he wanted all the slavery to be eradicated. So what happens here is that when all these people, they join together all their uh, pains and struggles and they bring in all the elements to Billy Lincoln. As these people say, now Abraham Lincoln comes back. As Abraham Lincoln comes back to revisit the corpse of the boy, what happens is, is that all the people so happy that they would, uh, Willie Lincoln would say, are late the pain of all the souls to Abraham Lincoln. But Abraham Lincoln, as he sits with the corpse, and Willie Lincoln joins the body of Abraham Lincoln, but uh, uh, Willie Lincoln could not convey anything of these matters to Abraham Lincoln. And uh, he says to their uh, uh, disappointment that he feels Abraham Lincoln is uh, not taking or not receiving any uh, communication from his side. So <laughs> he says that Willie Lincoln reveals the truth. The truth is that, that they are going to reach their death. They are not going to uh, leave this, uh, they are not going to go back to earth. So, only one uh, truth he reveals that they are all dead. They, are, they have to go up to the place of judgment. So, as he says, uh, many people they understand that they are dead and they have to leave the park immediately. Uh, some people, just like uh, the first one, uh, Abigail Glass, uh, she immediately leaves the bardo. Uh, when a soul leaves the bardo, uh, a particular mode of transformation goes on. The transformation is nothing but uh, we call it as matter light blooming phenomenon, which uh, George Saunders coined. What is this called? Uh, matter light blooming phenomenon. Matter lighting, matter light blooming phenomenon, phenomenon is nothing but when a uh, soul travels through the bardo, there will be a sudden explosion. With the explosion, a light comes out, uh, even the situation, that means the body emits light, and as they move from Bardo to another place, they are disvoggled into different shapes. Those shapes, that means whatever that they may have attained in their future. And uh, now for example, this uh, Willie Lincoln, when he moves out of the Bardo, what happens there was, he uh, go, he becomes a young man and he marries a, a woman there, he gives birth to child and he lives a happy life and he uh, dies in sleep. Uh, that was all a beautiful life and the future which Willie Lincoln had, suppose if he is not dead. So when one person passes from Bardo to another, which is uh, uh, Travers, which uh, one person goes from Bardo to another place, it is all things happen. And, uh, some people who still who do not want to go, still who still wanted to stay there, they were seduced. I can say they were tempted by some celestial ops. Uh, we can say some light blocks. Light blocks are nothing but angels. These come and they tempt him. For example, 
a woman wanted to visit all the places she wanted to be back with her children three children and she wanted to take the responsibility of the three kids but that doesn't happen because his husband does not uh, do not, does not take the responsibility of the kids and she wanted to be in her husband's shoes and she wanted to go back to his kids but that didn't happen and uh, she wants really lincoln to help her so that she can go back to earth and uh, can take care of her children and this is what goes on in the mind of a uh, woman there but uh, as uh, these angels come and tempt them they show a picture just like uh, a virtual a 3d picture like we can say a uh, hologram just like hologram they just display three kids uh, standing in front in front of her and having uh, nice garments which uh, she bought for them uh, during some season for example festival times so looking at them she feels so happy thinking that they are with her she immediately leaves the bardo so such things happen in the bardo itself and uh, many characters in this part we can see these people they leave the bardo making all the sounds but a few people stay there and the villain lincoln as he moves from one place to another place and feeling so sad that uh, abraham nickel is not going to come back he gets disappointed and he uh, lays there meanwhile tendrils uh, this picture you can see some tendrils okay uh, some tendrils were there uh, and they just catch him and uh, uh, so that he can get stuck up in the border itself and uh, on the other hand uh, reverend overly thomas goes there to help the boy and uh, he takes him out while trying to save uh, will lincoln he gets uh, caught by tendrils and they just keep him uh, in the bardo and uh, immediately then he calls upon light blocks to take his body out so as his body is taken out uh, there is an angel space which was a uh, face which is imprinted on carapace and that uh, carapace is clearly seen by the other people there and the other characters so is very angry and uh, he is now going to the placement of judgment so finally uh, the whole book ends with a positive note of course it's not a positive note it's a randomness we do not know what uh, what happens in the end randomness is another uh, post modern element other does not give us a conclusion and he leaves it uh, open ended because readers might take uh, whatever they feel after reading the book in the end all the characters especially slaves they join the body of abraham lincoln and they proceed into the civil war whether to continue or whether to stop so they all move and this is what the conclusion goes on with the uh, book and uh, the book is also uh, has got a lot of characters as i told you and uh, post modern elements randomness i told and uh, the important thing is that uh, two important then we will end the end of the session this book has got uh, two pages which have which consists of only two lines each or one line each which indicates that uh, other wanted to communicate the people that uh, after this life uh, after this life nothing there goes nothing but a white noise so that would is clear the symbolism for the people who read uh, the book that after this life there is nothing but a white noise and we can see a lot of grammatical errors in the book some of the uh, dialogues were not punctuated properly even billy lincoln's dialogues were not punctuated properly it shows that uh, it is a clear symbolism for the people those who live this life that means all the grammar and the language it portions all this uh, are earth status it's not something as a uh, life status so what george saunders want to convey us that nothing lasts long and nothing is permanent and whatever we see important it's not going to carry the same importance once we die so this is all about the book and uh, there are uh, many things that i like to speak and if time permits i would like to continue with the other session thank you sir 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 charts
Sir, I cannot hear you. Episode of to be broadcasted.